Uh, opportunity is like the, the story of the six blind men and the elephant, you know, trying to figure out what, what, what it all is. And tonight we're going to explore this idea of the opportunity from three different perspectives. We have the scientist, Professor Sir Richard Friend. We have the CEO, Dr. Simon Bransfield Garth, and Sina in policy now, but he's a recent graduate. And you were a president as chairman, weren't you? Where are you, Sina? Yeah. There he is. He's over there. there you are. You were president and the chairman of Q. Both, Both president and, and. Wow. You need an award for that, I'm sure. Okay. So let's hand over to Richard to take you through the, the genesis of the opportunity in plastic electronics. Thank you, Richard. Well, uh, th thanks, Shai. It's a great um, <clears throat> privilege to be first on the podium for this fantastic uh, event. Uh, I, I think Enterprise Tuesday is one of the things that sort of defines why Cambridge is uh, an interesting place. Uh, it's, um, it didn't used to be like this uh, when I first turned up. So I'm going to give the talk of the scientist. I'm not even in the engineering department. I'm in the physics department. And in physics, we're supposed to do things which are sort of fundamental and blue skies and not obviously useful. Um, and uh, quite some time ago, we wandered into something which obviously was useful, uh, which c caused a few eyebrows to be raised. Um, uh, uh, but it's all been good fun. So I've been involved in making, um, well, co-founding uh, three companies now. Um, and we're going to hear about the last one this evening, which is how to uh, uh, save the planet by finding renewable energy that really works. Just a small challenge. Um, so I I'm going to talk about the technology and the landscape and how one can see that as um, presenting an opportunity. Um, but what I hope I'm, you'll get as I, when I stop is that I've actually only just begun the story and the hard work really begins when the company starts. And there, Simon and Sina will give you the real story. So plastic electronics, the technology landscape, uh, uh, in uh, no more than a few minutes. Uh, so um, here's the technical slide. Uh, we were working more than 20 years ago on uh, molecules, long chain molecules, or polymers, or plastics, um, which to most uh, casual observers, when they're sort of dissolved up in some solvent, would look like fluorescent paint. And this one here, and those who like chemistry will know what it is, um, is uh, it's a long chain molecule that looks like yellow green fluorescent paint. Um, but it has a particular property, which is why we were interested in it as an object for um, appropriate research in uh, semiconductor physics, which is that uh, the double bonds uh, that are sort of alternating along the polymer chain, the carbon-carbon double bonds, are a clue that actually you can move electronic charges, electrons and holes, up and down the chain, and actually between chains too, and that what we got was a sort of silicon, except that rather than having to hew it out of single crystals, which are expensive and they break, uh, we had uh, semiconducting paint, or ink. Um, so there was a possibility that we could make transistor structures or diodes ways that were completely different to the standard silicon roadmap. So I don't know why it's got screwed up here, but never mind. Um, so we, we made a very simple device. This is Jeremy Burroughs, Donald Bradley, um, and others back in 1989. We published it in 1990, but before that we filed a patent, uh, which was like a sort of um, uh, double bonus because a patent is another publication. So to any research student thinking about finding a patent before you publish, uh, remember you actually get two for one if you file a patent first. It just, you just have to do it in the right order. Uh, so it's a very simple structure. We literally painted a thin layer of this green plastic between two electrodes. as transparent to deuterium oxide and evaporated aluminium or magnesium or calcium on the top. And um, what was discovered is that you put a few volts across it and it glows. Quite a lot of light comes out. Um, and we discovered that it's possible to use a, a plastic, a special sort of plastic, um, to make um, a light emitting diode. So we formed a company, Cambridge Display Technology, and 20 years later, it's part of Sumitomo Chemical Company, with about 160 people working in and around Cambridge. And what has happened in the intervening 20 years is that what was a laboratory demonstration using some stuff that was good enough to produce a diode that lasts for a few minutes, which is all you need to get published in Nature, um, to something which is good enough to be used, um, and it just has taken a huge amount of serious 
um, industrial development to convert what was um, you know, pretty grubby stuff into, if you like, the organic equivalent of silicon with that level of uh, detail, attention to um, purity and control of manufacture. So that Sumitomo chemical CDT activity now supports um, some pretty serious um, technology. One of the great things is that you can pattern by inkjet printing, so uh, there are all sorts of interesting ideas about distributing diodes, light emitting diodes over large um, areas. So not exactly our technology, but some sort of parallel technology that came from Kodak originally uh, is what is the display in a Samsung smartphone. They're actually rather better displays than Apple. Uh, Apple just borrow other people's technology. Samsung actually develop technology. Um, <laughs> Um, so that is, if, I mean, that's a, a several billion dollar a year product, but the landscape of what may be possible um, is much wider. Um, really large displays uh, made by um, the inkjet printing of the Sumitomo materials are looking really nice. Uh, they're not in the market yet. Uh, it is almost inevitable that uh, the crystal display will be displaced by uh, organic LED displays because they're potentially, but not yet, cheaper, uh, but they're faster, brighter, and better contrast ratio, and they don't have viewing angle problems, which is why they've found their way into Samsung smartphones as a first application. Amazingly, they can be really efficient, so the, the world's lighting manufacturers look at this as a way to produce interior lighting, where what you want is a panel rather than a point source. So OLED stands for Organic Light Emitting Diode. Organic TFT stands for Organic Thin Film Transistors, and another company we started in 2000, Plastic Logic, uh, produces flexible back planes of transistors printed or equivalent onto a sheet of plastic, um, which you can't do with silicon because the plastic would melt uh, because your silicon is processed at too high a temperature. So flexible electronics coming from um, these plastic transistors. Um, and it looks as though everything is possible. Um, and then last, um, in the bottom here, um, are solar cells. Uh, and solar cells would be great. Uh, we all know that we need them, um, and we know that the problem is that they're too expensive, unless you manage to get your solar panels up before December the 11th last year um, with a large feed-in tariff, which means uh, that everybody else subsidizes you. Um, but, but they're basically still too expensive. So the problem is that in this landscape, there's a sort of technology um, logic to it, but there's also an economic logic. And the logic is that you will pay quite a lot for a smartphone with a display that is better than another smartphone. So it's an object that you can get into the market because it is better, um, not that it's cheaper. Uh, and that has been the driver for you know, the top line. But by the time you come down to solar cells, you don't care. All you're doing is buying electricity. So the problem is, how do you manage to do something where at the outset the market is pretty much commoditized. Um, and that's, that, that's the challenge. Well, you can make them, um, and the research interest um, is that there's an existence proof, and that's photosynthesis. Uh, green plants um, do a huge amount more than just produce electricity. They produce it, and then they convert it into chemistry, um, and they're damn good at it. Um, and there's lots of jargon there on the slide for those who like it. Um, but they do a very clever thing, which is stripping apart an electron from its partner positive charge, um, uh, following uh, the energy being received from the photon in the um, absorbing molecules. And they do it actually by having a juxtaposition of two different molecules, one of which prefers an electron, and the, one of the other prefers to keep the positive charge. And that, that way it sort of strips apart something which would otherwise be fluorescent, as we used in the light emitting diode. So, Actually, it is possible to, in an extremely crude way, uh, do some of what photosynthesis does. Um, and um, what's turned out um, in the field is that things which were much cruder than ought to have worked uh, do work. And a lot of our research now in the Cavendish is understanding why, in fact, they work and therefore how we can do it better. So green plant photosynthesis is, is astonishingly sophisticated, what goes on. I'm not going to run through it all. Uh, but there are bits that do the sort of um, light harvesting here. 
electrons get pushed off to do reductive chemistry to produce um, an ADPH and ATP and so on, all that, and the holes that get pushed the other side oxidize water to produce oxygen gas. And there's all that in addition to what is actually an incredibly clever solar cell. Um, and what we do instead is something much simpler. We literally mix paint. Uh, we use the same principle of requiring a donor and acceptor to pull the electron and hole apart, but what's done is just to take the two materials, um, two polymers or one polymer and a molecule, and mix them together and paint them down or print them down. And remarkably, you can get the right sort of structure that allows light to sort of pump photon energy in um, and we get charges apart and we can collect them. So, um, the, the, those who like the science, that, that bit of the slide. And the efficiencies have got quite good. Um, they're, they're now up to 10%. Um, Silicon solar cells are the, the high teens, but um, the, the, the organics will get there. So, what's really exciting um, is that the recipe is literally as simple as I've described it. You can mix the materials together in a common solvent, uh, preferably not chlorinated because they're toxic, um, and then print. So the proposition is that you could literally start with a roll of plastic substrate and put it through additive manufacturing processes, sort of roll-to-roll -roll printing, I mean obviously very schematic here, and out comes rolls of printed stuff like that, which are solar cells. So it's fantastic because it's cheap. Um, and it's cheap for all sorts of obvious reasons. Uh, we're using very small amounts of stuff, um, so there's not a lot of glass and backing and whatever. Uh, we're assembling more or less at room temperature, so it, isn't, um, it doesn't involve um, growing silicon crystals at thousands of degrees or whatever, so there isn't a lot of extraneous heat used. Um, and it's almost as good as making a green leaf, um, but not quite. So there's a sort of figure of merit for what we ought to be able to do, and that is the energy payback time. How long um, does a, 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 um, an object that does something with sunlight need to be in sunlight before it's paid off the energy required to make it? And obviously a green leaf for a deciduous plant, a tree, is probably profitable within a few weeks of sprouting in the spring. That's weeks. Um, but silicon solar cells you measure in years, not months, but years, a few years of collecting electricity and being subsidized by the taxpayer, if you're lucky, um, in order to have paid off the energy involved in making the solar cell, the silicon, and putting it on your roof. So that's the gap that we hope to fill, and this is um, plausibly the way to do it. Now, I mentioned something about sense, uh, uh, the uh, efficiency. I don't need to say more. So at this point, um, if you're gullible, uh, you'll think that I've given you an incredibly good sell uh, because I've um, convinced you that we have the potential for lowest cost uh, because we're using very little material and the manufacturing process is very energy efficient, so it all flies. Um, and not only do we reduce the cost of the solar cell, but what's even more important is that we reduce the system costs uh, because it isn't just making the silicon, it is all the accoutrements that go with it, the glass, the panel, the, you know, the picture frame and so on, uh, the cost of putting scaffolding up if it's heavy and breakable to get it on your roof and so on. So if you can make solar cells uh, robust and unbreakable, um, then you can pull the system cost down as well, so it's a no-brainer. Um, so um, that is, um, in some sense, um, my job done. I mean, 819 is the company that we started in 2010 uh, to develop that, uh, with some great printed solar cells coming um, out of the uh, uh, outfit on the Science Park. But the problem is that that is um, only the start. I I've described, if you like, a technology opportunity. It is the technology push. Um, but I have not uh, described something which amounts to um, what it is I'm going to go and buy um, in the shop, or whether it's a shop or whatever. And it's that trans translation of what quite correctly is a technology push that you know, we should try and generate in the university, file patents, protect, gather teams together to give a technology advantage. But at that point, we have to discover what a market pull is. Um, and that's the point when I take the microphone away and hand it on to Simon. I don't need to say it anymore.
across the stage. Okay, thank you, Richard. So, um, thank you for that uh, introduction. So, so this is kind of where I sort of joined the party. Um, so, Richard had done a fantastic job of uh, selling uh, plastic electronics, and uh, I joined this company called 819. Anybody know why it's called 819? Well done, take a prize, yes, very good. Time it takes for light to get from sun to the earth, roughly eight minutes, uh, 19 seconds. Um, so, so when you think about solar panels, this is what you think about. Um, you think about panels that you stick on your roof. As Richard said, the vast majority of solar panels are not viable in the world. Um, and the only reason that they work economically is because the UK government, German government, whichever government you choose, um, decides to pay you vastly in excess of the value of the electricity uh, for the electricity coming out of your solar panels with a view that that will then engender a market which is big enough that eventually solar panels will be, uh, will be viable. But there are plenty of challenges uh, with these sort of solar panels and as Richard said, um, there is this rather interesting plastic solar stuff which you print rather like plastic bags and in fact you can print it at speeds of maybe 10 meters per second um, out of a relatively low cost uh, piece of uh, machinery. And so uh, you eliminate many of the inherent problems that you have in solar panels. Um, for instance, that um, many of the chemicals inside uh, solar panels are actually relatively rare um, and, and they're going to disappear. Um, there is a huge amount of energy that goes into uh, making the panels in the first place. And the cost of building a solar plant is actually quite big. So typically, to make a one gigawatt plant, it costs about a billion dollars, roughly. Um, so if you reckon that for solar to have any real influence in the world, it's got to be somewhere around a terawatt, you're up to a kind of trillion dollars, and it's beginning to get into sort of serious money. So you might want to find some other ways of going to do that. So, so plastic solar is going to solve that problem, and, and we're all going to go home rich. So you know, what's not to like? Well, Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, so the first one is that organic technology still has a lot of work before it becomes something that is viable. But a key characteristic is that at the moment, organic solar has a lifetime of about five years. A conventional solar panel has a lifetime of about 20, 25 years. And the existing solar market right now is completely commoditized. So about five years ago, a one watt of solar panel cost about uh, $5. Today it costs about 65 cents, something like that. Um, and essentially, the investment community have run away from solar as fast as they possibly can. Um, and there is virtually nobody making money in solar right now. So you've got a problem, and this is a sort of characteristic problem, of how do you take a product and put it into an already commoditized market? Because the problem is that however good your plastic solar is, until you get your plastic solar to scale, it's never going to compete with the indigenous um, capability that's already there. So that's something that you have to uh, try and fix. And traditionally what you try and do is to try and find a little niche market that only works with that particular technology that you come up with. So um, you know, Polaroid um, cameras, um, became popular in the 1920s um, because basically they could um, take pornographic photographs and they didn't have to go and be um, uh, developed by anybody else and that was the, the niche which then enabled uh, polarized photographs um, to develop into a large business. Um, so how are you going to do that with, with solar? Well, this is something that um, you know, Shai will no doubt um, talk to you guys about. This is how do you think about your product? What do, you, what do you want to do that's new? Are you going to go into something that is a brand new product in a brand new market, which is kind of, I guess, what an iPad is? Um, or are you just going to stretch a bit? Are you going to stretch a, an existing product into a new market? Are you going to stretch um, an existing market um, uh, in, in, into uh, a new product? So, when people looked at this for um, uh, plastic solar, three markets came up. Um, one was building integrated, uh, one was consumer devices, and one was emerging markets. And clearly, the one you wouldn't go for here is emerging markets, because they're, they're kind of small and incidental and difficult to get to. 
Um, so you look at the other ones and you kind of think, okay, how would I go and deal with those? Well, consumer devices are an interesting market. Um, they have the advantage that the product doesn't have to last very long, so the fact that your solar cell only lasts five years is not a problem because the thing that it's built into uh, probably doesn't last as long as five years, so that's kind of good. Um, and so people thought about things like, well, how about if I put uh, solar cells into television remote controls? Um, so I call, I'll go after the worldwide market for television remote controls. And that works fine until you start doing a little bit of mathematics. Um, so the first bit of mathematics, well, actually, no, the first bit is the marketing bit, which is actually that your television remote control has to work in the dark. So then you've got to put a battery inside your television remote control to take power from the solar cells so that your television remote control will work in the dark. But also, the, the actual amount of solar cell that you need is about that big. And when we did the calculation, we reckoned that we could serve the entire European market of television remote controls in about two afternoons of production. So that's kind of tricky. So we thought, OK, well, let's, let's just not bother with that. Let, let's go look at the building integrated market. And building integrated is much more interesting. You've got all these buildings. Just think of America, big glass buildings. You've got a, um, a stipulation coming along in 2020 that says that essentially all buildings have to be carbon neutral. And they're not going to be carbon neutral unless they have some way of generating power. So um, there's a huge opportunity coming in 2020 to go and put solar cells into buildings uh, in order to provide power into those buildings. And that's all true. Um, but there are a few problems. One of the problems is topology. And that is that the sun is up there and buildings tend to be vertical. And so the amount of sunlight that falls on the vertical face of a building is only the amount of sunlight that covers the area that um, comes from the angle of the sun. So actually, it doesn't matter how tall your building is. You don't get any more sunlight uh, on, on the face of the building. The other one is latency. And, and as you'll find if you get into business, latency is the thing that kills you in a business. If you want to be a small, successful business, you have to be in a technology area where you can make progress quickly. If you don't make progress quickly enough, however good your idea, other people will come along and um, deliver on it, um, and big companies will make money, but you as a small company uh, won't make money. The building market is probably the world's worst market for latency. So if you imagine how it goes, let's assume that there is a building that needs to be built and the architect decides that uh, they're going to put solar power into this building because uh, uh, that way it will meet the regulations in 2020. The first thing they need to do is to have a technology which is sufficiently robust and reliable that the architect is going to put his name against it. So you've got to go through all of the development processes, all the certification processes, all the other processes that are needed before the architect even thinks about designing in your product. So it takes seven years to go do that. Then the architect designs your product in, and it takes another seven years to go and build the building. So you've now got 14 years between when you had your whizzy idea and this nice piece of technology that really worked, and when it actually ended up in a building. And frankly, 14 years is just an eon in the timescale of uh, uh, smallish companies. So one of the markets that we started to look at was the off-grid market uh, in emerging countries. And we looked at it because actually it's jolly big. If you look at the population of the world, about 20% of people or so still don't have access to electricity. In fact, in Africa, there is mobile phone coverage of about 70% of the population, and there is electricity coverage of about 20%, roughly. So there's 1.3 billion people, 1.3 billion consumers um, who need your electricity. And there are some very specific places where people uh, have use for that. So one of them is lighting. And right at the moment, if you don't have electricity, you use kerosene, you use candles, whatever. Yes, genuinely in Zambia, 80% of people still use candles for lighting today. And people in that situation are paying not just a little bit more for their power, 
but absolutely disproportionately more for their power. So if you think about it in the UK, you sometimes get kind of a scandal where um, people who have a pay-as-you-go meter are paying 30% or 40% more for their electricity than people who have direct debit. And effectively, the poorest people pay the most for their commodity. If you take that into Africa and you put that in the context of kerosene, people are not paying 30% more, they're paying 30 times more for their light from kerosene. And in fact, the total amount of money that's spent on kerosene worldwide is about $38 billion, roughly. The carbon footprint of it is roughly equivalent to that of Argentina. Um, and so it actually is a, a genuine market. And the other one that is really weird is the uh, amount of money that people spend to put electricity into their mobile phones. So you'd be amazed how many mobile phones you have in Africa, but you don't have the electricity to go and charge them up. So people have to go and pay to charge up their mobile phones. And it typically costs between 20 and 30 cents every time somebody goes and charges up their mobile phone. So the market for putting electricity into mobile phones is somewhere between a 10 and 20 billion dollar market in its own right. So these sounded like useful numbers um, and something we could go do with. And the thought was, well, actually, in that market, you know, we've, we've already seen that in order to make solar work in, um, uh, in the UK, you need government subsidies. But actually, that's because you're competing against the cost of electricity that comes out the wall. If you're competing with 30 times the cost of electricity coming out the wall, hey, even solar can compete in that in market. So, you know, maybe we can go do something. So how comes the world isn't awash with all this stuff? And it comes back to the fundamentals of um, renewables in general, which is that if you own renewables, you essentially are your own power station. So if I go and put a wind vane or a um, solar panel or something on my roof, I'm becoming an electricity generator. I'm not a consumer of electricity. I've got to become a generator. And that means that I've got to fund the capital cost of creating that product. Now, already in the West, we find that very difficult. In places like Africa, that's impossible. And so we kind of had this idea of, well, could we turn that around? Could we, in order to create a market for our plastic solar cells, could we find a business model that would make this stuff work in, in Africa? And what we did was to combine mobile phone technology and solar technology so that people can pay for their solar equipment as a service rather than paying for it up front. And that turns out to work rather well. In fact, it works so well that people end up spending less on their solar power than they were previously spending on their kerosene and their mobile phone charging. So that then fundamentally changes the business proposition into that market. Instead of going to a customer and saying, um, we got this wonderful thing, it's called solar, um, it will um, get rid of the nasty fumes from kerosene, you'll get more light, uh, everything will be great. You simply go to the customer and say, um, how would you like to halve the amount of money that you're spending on energy? Oh, by the way, we kind of got this solar thing and it um, gets rid of your kerosene fumes and so on and so forth. And so it fundamentally changes the demand profile um, in the customer for the product, essentially what's not to like. And, and so um, that's been something that's been extremely successful. And so in Kenya, for example, um, people are spending about $6 a month on a solar power solution compared to about $13 per month uh, previously on kerosene and on um, uh, mobile phone charging. So then we started thinking about, okay, so what happens next? So, Imagine that we put in a $60 solar light system. You could say, we will charge people a dollar a week and we'll charge them a dollar a week forever because um, they're saving money compared to kerosene, so why can't you go and charge them forever? But then you kind of think, well, actually that doesn't sound altogether right to go to the poorest people in the world and charge them over years hundreds and hundreds of dollars for something that fundamentally costs $60 in the first place. So maybe what we should do is, when people have got to the point where they've paid off their original piece of equipment, maybe we give them the opportunity to upgrade to something a bit bigger. Because actually, people don't want to eliminate um, kerosene in their homes. Actually, what they want to do is progressively get towards um, the sort of lifestyle that you and I have. Um, they want to have televisions, washing machines, um, you know, cars, so on and so forth. 
So perhaps what we can do is, in a stepwise manner, use this model that we've come up with to uh, enable people to go through these various stages. We, we call it the energy escalator. And what it does is to provide a transformative effect on uh, people in emerging economies. So imagine down the bottom, you're in a, um, a hut in um, uh, Mozambique somewhere, um, and you're essentially a subsistence farmer. Over a period of time, by spending less money than you were previously spending on kerosene, you get to the point where you're still a subsistence farmer, but now you've got access to the internet through your phone, you've got access to communication through your phone, you've got access to uh, media through television and radio, you've got access to entertainment. Now what you've done is, in a sense, you've jumped over the Industrial Revolution, and you've got a subsistence farmer who's now part of the knowledge community. Because you can send a tweet from a hut in Mozambique just as well as you can from a penthouse flat in uh, New York. And so what's happened is in these relatively small steps, we've actually taken something which is um, actually quite a significant, profound uh, uh, impact on the society in which we're working. And then beyond that, you can say, well, actually, why do we have this high voltage anyway? Well, the reason you have high voltage is because it's got to go a long way. But you're actually not going a long way because your electricity is being generated on your roof. So now let's get rid of high voltage. Let's have low voltage. Now people don't get electrocuted in their houses because there isn't any high voltage anymore. You don't need to train people to be electricians because, hey, what's difficult about, you know, sort of twisting a few wires together? And you end up with a whole new approach to electricity generation in, in a rural market. So there's a couple of photos of, of, of this sort of stuff in action. So how does this then relate back to the plastic solar? Well, we've done all this because we needed a market for our plastic solar. But more importantly, what we've done is something that you need to do in an entrepreneurial environment, and that is follow the journey. When you see the story explained like this, it sort of seems kind of coherent. But it wasn't all thought through that way. There, there was no sort of... Uh, morning where we all woke up and wrote out the whole thing in chapter and verse. This is something that's evolved over time, and it evolves because you come across problems and you solve them, and then you kind of think, hey, that could be interesting, we could do something different with that, and then you step on, and you step on, and you step on, and you step on, and so on and so forth. So what we did in the end was to split two companies and created Azuri, which is the, uh, the, the company here, to be the services arm which is developing the solar technology. Um, and we are still developing in 819 the plastic solar. And when the technology for the plastic solar is in a suitable state, we will then be able to drop that into the Azuri marketplace of hundreds of thousands or millions of customers who want cheap, lightweight, robust solar cells, which will give power in this $50 billion market uh, in the emerging markets for uh, solar energy. So it's just a rough idea of some of the geographical deployment that we've done in the last uh, 18 months. Um, and then this really sort of expands out uh, through, through the rest of the world thereafter. Um, so, so why do we do it? Um, well, there's no simple answer to that. Um, this is really a very personal thing. But actually, it's not all about money. Um, so th there, are, there are many people who talk about starting up companies just because it's to, to go make money. If you go and speak to the founder of IKEA, he actually lives in a relatively modest house in, um, uh, in, in Scandinavia. Um, it's about creating something. It's about making a difference. It's about the challenge. It's about learning. It's about all those sorts of things. And yeah, you know, to make some money, that's a good thing to do as well. And nobody's going to complain about that. Um, but there's a lot more to entrepreneurship than simply thinking that you're going to walk away with a very fat check. It also helps that uh, businesses are making a real difference in the world. So this is a little bit of data. Um, so uh, these are the customers of these solar power systems. Um, on average, their use of kerosene has dropped from $2.30 down to $0.30. Cents. The only reason it's $0.30 cents is we haven't got a portable version yet, and a lot of people have outside toilets and so on, um, but we're fixing that one. Um, and this is one that I thought was quite nice. Uh, on average, families are productive for 3.2 hours per day more than they were before they had uh, electric lighting. On average, kids are spending two and a half hours a day extra doing homework. 
And where you find that's really impactful is for women. So um, women in traditional economies tend to have their day packed from dawn till dusk. They look after children, they look after the household, they cook, um, they fetch firewood, they do all these things. And if you suddenly give somebody three hours a day in addition, now they've got time that they can spend on other stuff, on studying, <coughs> on earning extra money, and so on and so forth. So the impact of, of doing this stuff really can be quite considerable. Um, so, so what are the lessons from it? Well, I think um, I've touched on a few of these. One of them is don't be afraid to go with the flow. Just because you started an, an organization with a particular idea, if the genuinely is a better idea, go with the better idea. Now, that can be something that's a bit scary for shareholders. Um, it's certainly scary if you've got corporate shareholders because they've got a particular view of why they invested. Um, but you just have to carry, with them, carry them with the journey. But very often, the ideas you come up with are much better than the ones you had uh, in the first place. Um, absolutely move fast and make sure that you face reality. If something doesn't work, don't carry on hammering away to try and make it work. Change in order to make sure that it does work. And really think outside the box. Um, but particularly, I would say it's important to capture a vision. You've got to be able to inspire other people. The first people you're going to inspire are going to be your investors. But you've got to inspire your employees. You've got to inspire other people to really want to work with you. And just keep innovating. Keep doing it. And it's tremendous fun. So I'll leave you with that little slide. That was uh, a, a chap in Zambia. And I thought the quote was quite nice. It gives you an idea of uh, some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, and because I'm standing in front of 300-odd uh, uh, students, I'm going to take the opportunity. Um, we are working with a lot of interns. We're working with a lot of other people. If you want to get involved with the stuff that we're doing, then um, just speak to, uh, uh, send an email to info at azuritechnologies.com. We'd be delighted to talk to you. Thank you very much. Right, so I'm speaker number four. Uh, I appreciate that's not a popular slot, so I hope I've still got your attention. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here tonight uh, on a number of levels. One, because I was a student here not long ago, and so it's nice to get my own back. I, I used to sit over there. Secondly, um, as, as Shai said, I, I was very involved with CU, and I'll come back to that later, the entrepreneurship uh, activities in Cambridge. And I remember back in 2001 when I was sitting with Shai in a meeting discussing how the student body could be more involved with CFEL and how we could integrate our programs very closely. And suddenly you popped up with the idea of Enterprise Tuesday. And so it's very nice to be back 11 years later to see uh, the obvious uh, success of this. And it's a testament to all of your hard work and everyone who's here uh, tonight. So great. Um, so Shai asked me to tell you uh, a bit about, well, to, to cover the personal side of this story. So uh, as, as someone from here, someone who may have been sitting there not long ago, although I'm not as freshly minted as, as one, would, one would wish, Shai, it's been six years now, but uh, what brought me to 819, how I ended up where I ended up, and uh, so a very sort of personal story. And usually I'm much more comfortable talking about a product or a service, so there's going to be a lot of me's and I's, and I've gratuitously thrown in a lot of photographs, so I apologize in advance if this feels like a photo album and a bit nauseating. So, uh, what, <laughs> what I'm, I'm going to be talking about, essentially, uh, is it any of these buttons? Yeah, okay. So, uh, broadly, the structure of this very fast five or six minute talk is what drives me, uh, what has driven me, uh, how it all started, and it began very much in Cambridge, uh, what I was doing before 819, which took me to 819, and the, the time I spent with 819, that, the exciting ride with 819, and what's, what's coming up, at least for me. So, personal drivers, this is probably not too different to uh, you know, how anyone would maybe assess a, a business opportunity, or how you look at opportunities in your life. But uh, since we're talking about realizing opportunities and, and capitalizing on them, this is very much at the micro level. So if we heard a bit more about the macro and the business, here's at, at your level. How would you go about assessing an opportunity? Um, so it varies in shades and colors, but for me, these are the main things that I look for. Technology. Uh, yes, I love technology. Is it exciting? Does it, does it sort of make the hair stand on the back of your neck? Uh, if yes, that's a good thing. But is it suitable technology? So technology for the sake of technology is, is pointless. Uh, it, does it do what it's meant to do? And as you've seen tonight, the OPV and what it has been applied to certainly is an exciting technology. Uh, does, it, does it have good impact? 
Uh, very broad topic, but you, you, can, you, 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 you get what I'm trying to say there. Is it socially, environmentally uh, beneficial? Does it do good for humanity? Uh, I genuinely believe in that, and I think all of our team did as well, and that, that was something that drew me to the project. Is it entrepreneurial? Uh, I have a physical aversion to uh, non-entrepreneurial activities, unfortunately, and, and, and I went out of university directly into a startup, and I have tried to work in, in, in large organizations. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I think you should be able to work in large organizations if you have to, but I've not been able to. So it's, it's, a, it's a condition, and I don't mind. Um, is it disruptive, and can it scale? scale? Does it have disruptive scale? The base of the pyramid market that, that Simon just alluded to certainly has immense scalability and immense disruptive opportunity. Is it clever and unique? Is there something about it that you think, oh, that was, why didn't someone think of that earlier? Isn't that just amazing? Oh, these guys are so clever. And, and as you can see, the pay-as-you-go model has that. Whoever you explain it to turns around and goes, oh my god, that, that's just so clever. Why didn't anyone think of that? And that always gets me excited. Is there an interesting affiliation? I, I love Cambridge, so anything affiliated with Cambridge always gets me, gets me uh, up, and, up and running. And, and, you know, the 819 connection uh, with Cambridge was, was important. And the team. Uh, does the team excite you? Are the people uh, not only able to talk the talk, but walk the walk? And, you know, uh, I knew Professor Sirisha Friend's reputation before uh, coming to 819, because while I was at Cambridge, he was one of the early... Uh, characters in the environment here, who was not only a world authority in his, in his scientific field, but also very astute at, at business. And one of the strong supporters of us as students when we first began this whole entrepreneurship thing back in 99, 2000, when it really picked up, uh, he kindly sort of uh, keynoted at various events that we had, a big MIT Cambridge uh, entrepreneurship event. We had uh, a Duke of York launch of the competition. Again, Professor Richard Frame was there. So we were very uh, I, you know, his reputation preceded him, uh, CDT, Plastic Logic. So, uh, and then after that, I had the opportunity to meet the rest of the team, including Simon and, and, and his cohorts. And then it was completely uh, reassuring that this certainly is a world-class group of people. Uh, so I've, I've sort of covered that in, in the last bit. But everything I did at university had these two key themes of entrepreneurship and sustainability running through it. Um, I did my, my uh, undergrad here and then at the Institute for Manufacturing and my PhD. And we were very big on industrial sustainability at a time when it was very unfashionable. So we went and we studied uh, companies in, in Scandinavia and looked at how they see efficiency uh, and, uh, as the same as sustainability. Sustainability equals good business practice. And we came back and we gave a, a presentation on this to UK businesses, and it wasn't very positively uh, adopted at the time. Now, the Institute for Manufacturing has published the tome on industrial sustainability that's just been uh, released by, um, uh, by the team. So that's... That's good news. See you entrepreneurs. Th that was a five-year commitment for me. I, I, it was the love of my life at, at Cambridge. Uh, I know Chong feels the same, potentially. Uh, and we uh, really, during that period, brought in the whole concept of a green competition. And, uh, and I was adamant that not, not only should it stand as a standalone competition, but it should be a main criterion within the main business competition, because surely sustainability uh, should be part of every business. And then soon after leaving, uh, I left straight into a startup, uh, Cambridge Policy Associates, and, and a few startups from uh, the engineering department. Uh, a few years later, uh, an opportunity arose to join uh, what's, what's known as the Clinton Climate Initiative within the Clinton Foundation. And uh, although it wasn't a startup per se, it ticked all those boxes again. It was a small entrepreneurial team within a much larger organization, so it had a lot of resources. Uh, it looked at things with the same sort of, sort of ticks and, and crosses, but it wasn't, of course, a technology startup. But my logic to myself and my promise to myself was what I will do is I will take some time out and I will join this uh, interesting NGO with, with uh, the, the prospect of being able to get a good insight into what the latest and best thinking is in clean energy around the world, because that's what I was interested in, and I felt that this would give me that sort of scale and scope and, and connection. And, and it did. So because we were, uh, it was a very uh, business-oriented organization, so an NGO not quite in the way that you'd imagine, not a charity. So it leveraged markets to try and do large, at-scale shifts in climate change technologies, uh, high-impact, near-term, scalable solutions, mainly in carbon capture and sequestration and in solar, where it was felt that the biggest market failures existed and that the biggest push was required. Um, we, because of that, we were not seen as a, as a sort of threat, as a, as a 
group of tree huggers, we were seen as people who could help small businesses break through and new technologies gain real advantage in, in an otherwise very difficult competitive field. So we managed to really meet with some very, very interesting individuals. Soon after, in fact through that, that promise to myself came true, so I had an opportunity to work with uh, a very interesting startup in, in, in New York called Global Thermostat, uh, another high caliber team there, authors of the Kyoto Protocol, a team from Princeton and, and, and Bell Labs, billionaire backers, one of the, probably going to be the winners of what's known as the Virgin Earth Challenge, 25 million pound prize by Richard Branson. Uh, and I was working on developing their business development and strategy. Again, very interesting, turn everything on its head business model that uses the power of the markets to drive huge uh, social and environmental good. But it was at a very interesting event in Parliament where we were discussing clean energy that I bumped into Tom Brown, the uh, chairman of 819, before 819 was 819. And uh, it was a very serendipitous meet. It was a conversation uh, as I was leaving the room. And I said, so Tom, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm, I'm chairman of a very interesting company in Cambridge. That sparked box number one. And uh, who's in this company, Tom? Well, someone called Sir Richard Friend. Ah, tick number two. And what does this company do? Solar, fantastic, OPV. And, and so on and so forth. And so for me, it, it, it ticked all the boxes. It was the right sort of, something had happened. And I think what's not covered in this, in this, circ in this series of circles is what, what you can uh, cheesily call the X factor, which is something else. So it may, everything may fit, but you still don't get that good feeling. But then, but then there is something else that, 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 that sits above all this that makes that, you know, as I said, the hair stand on the back of your neck. Uh, we've already discussed uh, the impact that, that the organization can have so I'm not going to labor this too much, but you can see it was just on so multifaceted and so many levels. Um, so I had a brief. So we came for a conversation with, with Simon and team, and I was invited to, to join them on this, what was going to be an amazing journey. And uh, the brief was that this was a fledgling con concept of the, you know, the pay-as-you-go and, and its combination with the OPV, and we were going to have to move fast, we were going to have to scale really quickly, so we need to br build a brand, we need to educate the market on what this pay-as-you-go concept is. We need to find partners and customers, and we need to raise the finance to make this all, all work. So in terms of brand building and educating, uh, this was also an opportunity to be slightly innovative. So instead of going down the route of you know, putting out standard press releases or putting an advert in a paper, you, it doesn't work in this environment. This is un, uncharted territory. So you have to move uh, in, in what I like to call guerrilla warfare style of marketing. And, we, we knew, for example, this year was the year of sustainable energy for all. It was an initiative launched by Ban Ki-moon, and the coincidence with what we were doing was amazing. Wow, we've just started this concept, and all of a sudden, it's the year of sustainable energy for all. And we knew it was going to be launched in Abu Dhabi in January at the World Future Energy Summit, and we simply had to be there. So we managed to get ourselves on the main panel for solar discussions, which was very high level, and there we were talking about 819, so that got us right in there in the middle of that conversation. And then we started to do a few... Uh, well, I'm, I, you know, there's uh, no, need to, no need to put it any other way. We started doorstepping the people we actually really wanted to talk to, including Ban Ki-moon. So we uh, turned up at his launch of his uh, high-level Sustainable Energy for All event with all the press ready and uh, asked the question about, you know, the opportunities for pay-as-you-go solar. And uh, not only did the press hear everything we were saying, Ban Ki-moon and his team were now aware of who we were. So zoom forward uh, uh, a couple of months, and we were there at the sort of uh, mid-year relaunch of the project. We were already now linked into everyone that we had to be linked into. So that worked very well. We also managed to get a kit to the uh, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, and that was great for local press. Everyone heard that he was now using pay-as-you-go uh, solar. So <laughs> we also then targeted prizes. Prizes are great PR in, the, in this kind of uh, arena. So uh, things such as the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, we, we've won that award. There are a whole range of other awards that we've, we've, uh, we've gone in for, and I'm sure we're going to be picking them up. Uh, 819 and Azuri will be picking them up in, 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 in the near future. World Economic Forum titles, uh, Zaid Future Energy Prize, which is uh, sort of the Nobel Prize, if you like, of, um, of clean energy at the moment. Um, we would turn up at events on solar, solar briefings to, to investors about how the, the, the state of the solar market is a complete disaster. And we would, we would ask a question inquiring about the state of our company and why it was, you know, actually had a model that turned things on its head and, uh, and seemed to do well. That would draw in the investors again. Uh, we, we got ourselves into uh, the Rio Plus 20 talks in the United Nations um, uh, with the UN. And there again, it was this concept of building thought leadership. 
So uh, here comes the this warning, the gratuitous slide of pictures. But uh, we ended up being at the center of the conversations because of this, because of the, you know, we'd reached a tipping point. We'd played on all these network effects, and all of a sudden our stories were coming back to us. People were referencing us. People wanted to hear what we had to say. And everything from conversations with Mohammed Yunus, the founder, you know, the father of uh, microfinance, about our particular form of microfinance, and, you know, uh, we, we, we respectfully disagreed with each other on some of the elements, but uh, it was all fun and games to some extent. But it's, it's great that we're there and we are representing our story and we have built the brand. We have, you know, challenge of capitalizing on all this brand building. Uh, so one of the things that exercised me during this period of working with, with Simon and the team and 819 is that one of the big blockers in this, in this arena for uh, companies doing great good in the world is the irony of being unbankable. And uh, large pots of money out there that cannot be released to projects like this yet because of the irony of bankability. So if we'd asked for a nuclear power plant costing, costing $5 billion, for example, a small one, uh, that would be easy. That would be easy to raise money for. But a couple of hundred thousand pounds, for example, for a project that can really it's a whole different kettle of fish. But we know that, uh, with uh, new finance mechanisms, with the use of crowds and crowdsourcing, and so there are some interesting things happening, and you can be involved in all of those, uh, so stay tuned.